after the death of Mother Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her, the Prophet والسلام, was in mourning. He was sad. And he had so many things on his plate. The companions noticed that. They noticed that he had girls in his home to take care of with no woman in the house. He had so many obligations regarding his followers. Quran that is revealed to him. Idol worshippers that he is obliged to give da'wah and to call them to Islam. How to protect those who followed him and believed in him. So many things were occupying his mind with a touch of grief and sadness that no one can miss. Only then a suggestion for him to get married was proposed to the Prophet ﷺ by Khawla bint Hakim. And see, she was the wife of Uthman ibn Mad'un, one of his close companions. So she, she suggested, O Prophet of Allah, why don't you get married? So the Prophet said to her, alayhi salatu wasalam, who, who should I get married to? What are the proposals that you have for me? She said, a virgin or someone who's not a virgin, you pick. So he asked her, who was the virgin? She said, the daughter of your beloved companion, the most beloved person on earth, your heart, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, his daughter Aisha. Then the Prophet said, والسلام, who is the non-virgin? And she said, Sauda bint Zam'a. And the Prophet والسلام, praised her and complimented her when he heard her name. So, the Prophet said to her, go and check them out. Ask whether there is acceptance or not. Khawla went to Abu Bakr's house, and this is something that we will talk about tomorrow, inshallah. And then she went to Sauda's house. She met Mother Sauda, and she asked her, or actually she gave her the glad tidings. What blessings and goodness from Allah had come your way? So she said, what is that? And she said to her, the Prophet ﷺ had sent me to ask for your hand. Sauda was overwhelmed with joy. This is something that had never ever crossed her mind, not in her wildest dreams. And she said to her, I wish, meaning that I'm more than happy to accept and I wish that this can materialize, but I, I'm, I'm still not believing it. Please go and speak to my father. And so this father was not a Muslim. And her brother was not a Muslim as well, and he was a staunch enemy of Islam. But at the time, he was at Hajj. So Khawla went to meet this old, frail man. And she said to him, Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, had sent me to ask for Sauda's hands. This non-Muslim, although all the idol worshippers were at war and were at, with a lot of enmity and hatred to the Prophet ﷺ and to the religion that he had brought to them, when he heard his name, 
He said, he's an honorable, worthy man. This is the first thing that came into his mind. And he said it. And he asked Khawla, you proposed to me now. What about your friend, Sauda? Does she accept him as a suitor to her? She said she loves that. So the father said, call her to me. Sauda came. He addressed his daughter. Muhammad has sent a proposal to you. And he's an honorable, worthy person. Would you like me to marry you to him? She said, yes, father. So he said to her, to Khawla, call him. And he came and he got her married to him. So who is this Sauda? May Allah be pleased with her. And what is her story? You see, when a person is used to traveling first class and in staying in five or seven stars hotels, it would be difficult for him to go a little bit below his standard. And we know the standard of Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her. So why did the Prophet ﷺ marry after her this Sauda? And who is she? What does she have? Well, Sauda's name is Sauda bint Zam'a ibn Qais al-Amiriyya al-Qurashiyya. And her mother's name was Ash-Shumus bint Qais. She is the first woman the Prophet married after the death of his late wife Khadija bint Khuwailid. May Allah be pleased with her. And the Prophet remained with Sauda for three years. He was married to her alone for three years. She had no other co-wives. So what is the story of Sauda? Sauda was among the first to accept Islam among the companions in Mecca. She and her husband, who was her cousin, his name was As-Sakran ibn Amr. They both accepted Islam, suffered greatly on the hands of the idol worshippers in Mecca because they did not have that much power or influence, and they did not have the backing of a strong tribe to defend them. You see, when Muslims accepted Islam in Mecca, each person had one of the dignitaries of Mecca to protect him. Though that dignitary himself used to torture other Muslims and used to express enmity against Islam. But due to a reason or the other, that individual that went into his protection was safe from others. Sauda and her husband did not have that protection. So they fled Mecca and they migrated to Abyssinia. They crossed the Red Sea in boats. Only Allah knows what kind of boats were they. And they lived there under the protection of an Najashi, who gave them safe haven and allowed them to worship Allah as they wished. They fled with their iman, with their religion. They fled prosecution. All what they wanted was to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. That's it, nothing else. Let us worship our God. 
And this is what Allah mentioned in Surah Al-Buruj. وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا أَنْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَمِيدِ The enemies of Islam, the only thing that they do not like is that we worship Allah alone. If Muslims were to worship other than Allah, the non-Muslims would be okay with that. They would not prosecute them. They would not fight them. They would not kill them. The main reason for their attacks, their hatred, their enmity, their will to annihilate Muslims is because Muslims worship Allah alone. And they submit their will to Allah alone. No hidden agendas. Muslims are like an open book. You can tell exactly what they think, what they're thinking about. So they stayed in Abyssinia, worshiping Allah, though their hearts were still connected to Mecca, to the Kaaba, to their homeland. And to their surprise, rumors spread like wildfires. It spread like wildfire in Abyssinia among the Muslims that all the idol worshippers have accepted Islam. They were so happy. They were so joyful because now they can see the light at the end of the tunnel. They realize that this is the time for them to go back to their homeland. Only to discover after a treacherous journey across the raging sea in boats that only Allah knows what it was made of. When they reached Jeddah and then moved on foot to Mecca in a journey that took them four or five days, when they reached there exhausted and tired, they were faced by the brutal reality that what they had heard about the idol worshippers accepting Islam was fake news. It was a lie. So each one of the migrants looked for one of the dignitaries to enter in his protection and they managed to do so, except as Sakran and his wife Sauda, they had no one. And after that long journey, as Sakran who was in his late 50s, maybe early 60s, fell ill and died, leaving a widow who was Muslim among her family who were idol worshippers. She had no one to turn to. She had no one to seek his protection. So you can imagine the grief and sorrow she was in after all what she had suffered throughout the years. And for what? For just simply worshipping Allah the Almighty. Here was the breakthrough. He was the salvation. When the Prophet والسلام, proposed to her, she accepted in a heartbeat. She would not think twice. Who would think twice? What we can learn from this is that the Prophet والسلام, marriages were not based on his desire of women. Though that would have been totally acceptable and normal. No one in his right mind would condemn a man for 
liking women. This is human nature. Men like women. And this is why they get married. And this is what Allah mentioned in the Quran, that it was beautified in men's hearts, the love of women, of children, of gold and silver. All of these things were made beautiful to us by Allah Azza wa Jal. But what you should notice and pay attention to that the Prophet ﷺ was not as they accused him of being a womanizer. When he was 25 years of age, in the prime of his youth and strength, he married a woman 15 years older than him and stayed law uh, lawful and loyal for 25 more years not having a second wife, not having a con concubine, nothing. Totally devoted for her love. When she died, he could have chosen anyone from the Muslim companions around him. Anyone would have been honored to give him his daughter or his sister. He could have chosen Miss Universe if he was looking for lust and desire. He remained unmarried for a while. And when they, the companions proposed to him that he gets married, he married a woman in her early 50s. A woman described in the books of history as being huge and big in size, that anyone could identify her, though she, though she is covered from head to toe, but she can be identified by her size. In an authentic hadith, Umar used to tell the Prophet ﷺ, why don't you cover your women and not let them go out? And one day, Sauda went out of the Prophet's house, ﷺ, fully covered, and Umar saw her and say, said to her, Oh, Sauda, we recognize you. We know that you're Sauda. So she went back immediately and complained to the Prophet ﷺ of what Umar had said. And then Allah revealed to the Prophet ﷺ that it is permissible, it's okay for them to leave their homes for necessities like at the time, answering the call of nature, which was done outside the city for everyone. They didn't have any toilets in their homes at the time. So she was a, book, a big woman in size. And no one had ever said that she was beautiful or glamorous or wealthy or that she had anything special in her that would attract men. And we don't say this, may Allah forbid, to discredit her or to look down upon her. She's our mother. No one disrespects his mother. But it's just for you to contemplate. Is the Prophet Muhammad a womanizer? He chose a woman only for her religious commitment. She's a widow, she's alone, and she needed someone to protect her. The Prophet took it upon himself to be that someone. He married her. He opened her house for her. She stayed with him for three years, and the Prophet did not go and look for any other woman, though he could have. But he didn't. And this is a practical lesson that the Prophet is giving us, alayhi salatu wasalam, giving men, that when you get married, it's not the beauty that counts. It's not the wealth. It's the chemistry that you find with this woman, who if she is 
Allah fearing, she would make your house a paradise. Three years the Prophet lived with her, never ever alayhi salatu wasalam complained about her or said anything negative about her or the books of history reported a fight between them. She was a good, righteous, pious woman and the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam loved her. She was also a witty, smart woman. After the Prophet ﷺ married different wives for many different reasons, as we will come and discuss this, inshallah, she felt that she was too old for the Prophet ﷺ to give him his marital rights. So she took the initiative and said to the Prophet O Prophet of Allah, I love what you love. And all what I care about is your comfort and peace of mind. And because you love Aisha more than your other wives, I grant and give willingly and happily my night to Aisha. So every night you go to your wives, when it's my night, don't come to me, go to Aisha. And when it's Aisha's night, you go to Aisha. So you spend two nights with her rather than one night with her and one night with me. The Prophet والسلام, appreciated that for her. Mother Aisha herself, she said, there is no woman on earth I would like to be in her shoes. I wish I can be like her, except Sauda bint Zama. She is one heck of a woman. When she got old, she gave her night to the Prophet ﷺ as a gift, and she gave that night from herself to me. So the Prophet used to give me, Aisha, two nights and all the rest of his wives one night each. She was a wise woman. She did not have what we call possessive love. Nowadays women want to own their husbands. He should not leave the house without telling me where he's going. I would occupy his mobile phone with missed calls until he answers, where are you? What time are you coming back? Why don't you tell me? And if he were to think of getting married again, she would turn his life into a living hell. This is possessive love. This is not realistic. No one says, woman, go and search for a, another wife for your husband. No one says this. But if it were inevitable, if he is in need to, getting, to get married, a woman has to be as smart as Sauda, weighs the pros and cons and knows when to take a step back and let the ball rolling. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said to the wives of the Prophet, when they gathered once and they asked the Prophet O oh Prophet of Allah, which one of us wives will be the first to die after you, to catch up with you after death? Which one is the first to die? So the Prophet said والسلام, the longest, the one with the longest hand or longest arm. So they brought a measuring tool and they started measuring their arms to know which one of them was the longest arm. And they found that Zainab bin Jahsh was the one with the longest arm. After the death of the Prophet والسلام, it was Sauda that died first. Only then they understood the meaning of the 
longest hand or the longest arm, which means the most of you who gives charity the most. And the most generous of them all was Sauda, may Allah be pleased with her, the mother of the poor and the needy. She used to give all what she had to the poor. Umar once sent her money and she looked at it and she said, what is this? It's like dates. So many of them. And within minutes, she distributed the whole sack of gold and silver to the poor and the needy and she left nothing for herself. This was Sauda bint Zam'a, the mother of the believers, a woman that had nothing to attract men, that is normal men, to get married to her. Yet she drew the attention of the Prophet ﷺ with her Iman, with her religious commitment. And this is what qualified her to be the mother of the believers, your mother and mine. May Allah Azza wa Jal be pleased with her. She died at the reign of Umar ibn Khattab. May Allah be pleased with him. And some say that she died uh, at the year of 54 Hijrah. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Hada wallahu a'lam wa nisbatul ilmi ilayhi aslam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyina Muhammad. وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين